Welcome to Awake to Oneness Radio. I am Caroline Chang, your host. The mission of Awake to Oneness Radio is to inspire the world to awaken to the universal truth of oneness. Science is telling us, teaching us now that all life is interconnected. And spirituality has been teaching us this for eons. It's ancient wisdom and spirituality has been teaching us that we are one, um, literally all one. And when mankind awakens to the truth of oneness, there will be peace on earth. So today is a very special day. It, we have uh, my first video webinar and I have six amazing guests with us today and I'm so so excited today's show topic is the true nature of reality and on the panel we have some wonderful amazing guest speakers we have Suzanne Giesman and Pereira Sherry Perro Sandra Craigost Trigoskos, sorry Sandra about your name. We have David Dove Fishman and Nikki Hayes. That is our amazing panel for today. Now today's show actually was inspired. I was given the inspiration to do this panel discussion, this show from a listener. A listener from um, Australia wrote in to me and asked me to do a show that was dedicated to for parents who have lost um, children, or actually who has chil who have children who have transitioned, like myself. My son, Tran Kyle, transitioned two and a half years ago, and my listener has a son that transitioned, and she wanted me to do a show that focused on parents who have children that have transitioned. So that, that I pulled this panel together because actually from her idea, my thoughts were not just for parents, but for anyone who has a, a loved one who has transitioned. I wanted to do, so I pulled together this wonderful panel of former guests that would understand the true nature of reality from their own perspective. Like I said, we're all unique. When I use the word tr true, I'm talking about what resonate, uh, re resonates as true for me. And so each panel member will also speak from their resonant truth. So that's important to understand when we use the word true, especially in this reality. So um, I really am so grateful for my listener to write that inspirational email. So I pulled together this panel and today is my birthday. Uh, so that is another, this is just an amazing birthday gift that I would like to share with the world. Um, so I am going to go around the panel and introduce each one person, each panelist uh, one at a time. I'm going to ask them to give a brief introduction and th before we get into the meat of our discussion, which is the true nature of reality. I like to first bring on Suzanne Giesman, but I like to also say how I came across Suzanne. Hi, hi Suzanne. Hi, Caroline. Hi. I like to say Susan has done a show with, did a show with me back in May of 2016. And it was my son's birthday of a few months ago on Thanksgiving Day. And I wrote into Suzanne, emailed Suzanne and said, I would really love to connect with Kyle. And I really felt very close to Suzanne when I had her on her show. Um, and I knew I wanted to have a reading with her. So, and she said, well, let's do one on his birthday. And that was a beautiful, beautiful birthday gift um, she gave me on Kyle's birthday. And it was the first time that from her readings, many readings, that we actually got Kyle's voice on tape and my dog, Coco, who is in uh, spirit. Um, on tape. So it's called EVP. I had never heard of EVP. EVP. That was amazing. Amazing. Suzanne, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, yes, I'm a medium today, but uh, for most of my life, I was a Navy officer. I retired from the Navy after a 20-year career as a commander, 
uh, was a commanding officer and aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, very left brain, and uh, it was the death of my stepdaughter, Susan, who caused me to go 180 degrees from my former life to now, instead of serving my country, serving all of humanity, hopefully, but especially those who have lost loved ones. And let me tell you, I was as surprised as you were to hear that voice and that dog's voice coming through in your recording from your reading, but it's it's an honor to serve. And thanks for having me here today. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Suzanne. I'm so honored to have you here with these amazing, amazing panelists. So also going around the, the panel, now let, I'd like to introduce Anne, Anne Pierre. Actually, Anne was one of my first guests. I started uh, this show back in March of 2015, almost two years ago, and Anne was like my third guest. So, Anne, please, come, um, can you please share with the listeners your, your, a little bit about yourself? Um, I had a series of experiences in 1972 where um, Jesus appeared to me twice. I was not a believer in all this field, and I had all these paranormal experiences um, that year and uh, began to be able to see auras and see things before they happened, that kind of thing. Um, later on, I spent four years in a seminary atmosphere, um, getting a degree in the ministry, and so worked with that along with working as a, um, a psychic for 25 years um, as part of a research project. They would make two tapes of um, every reading that I did. I did probably 15, 20,000 readings. I'm not sure how many. And um, they were part of an ongoing research project where the doctors and all that I worked with would review that and look at it for their patients and all. So I did that. Right now, I'm not doing any private readings, but I am working on two books, 1-800-HEAVEN and Sometimes the Journey's Uphill. So that's kind of what I'm involved in right now. We just moved to Fountain Hills. You saw our little dog, Happy, earlier in the show. And uh, I have a real love of animals. I have a Facebook site called Cooking Oh, beautiful, beautiful. You said helping pet lovers, right? Mm -hmm, helping pet lovers. Uh, okay, I know that that resonates with another one of our guests <laughs> very much, but thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Anne. And I'd like to introduce the next uh, panelist I'd like to introduce would be Sherry, Sherry Pearl. Please, uh, actually, Anne introduced me to Sherry. So that's how I got connected with Sherry. And she was my guest just a few weeks ago. We did an amazing show. We had a wonderful show together. Sherry, please tell a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be in such wonderful company. Um, yes, Anne is a very dear friend, and I love her very much. And I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I was probably the biggest non-believer of any of these things until um, I was in my 20s. Um, up until then, I thought that people who talked about the things we're talking about today were either deluded or probably stupid. <laughs> and then I got severely ill with Crohn's disease, and that led to blood transfusions and hepatitis C being injected into me. And by the time I was 20, I was fighting for my life. And out of desperation, I contacted Harry Edwards in Britain. He's a spiritual healer. I didn't believe in anything as remote as spiritual healing, distant healing, because I never met him um, personally until I was well. I was in New Jersey. He was in Britain. I recovered so quickly that my head spun around. And that started what is now, I guess, a 45-year investigation of spirit. And all I can say is it's the best thing that ever could have happened because um, when you bring spirit into your life, everything makes more sense. Everything's richer and every, even pain is more tolerable. So I'm just grateful that I was brought to see that the spirit world is real. And if we can share that with others, then amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you for being a part of this panel. I'm so grateful. And now I'd like to introduce Sandra. And I know I pronounced your name incorrectly. So will you please pronounce your name correctly, your last name correctly for our listeners? Okay. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> uh, my name is Sandra Kurzakis. 
um, or Kira Zakos, uh, and I am in Toronto, Canada, and I'd like to introduce you to Whisper. And I had another cat walk by here. Her name is Tierra, and and uh, I can totally relate to you with the whole animal thing. I do a lot of animal rescue work and a lot of animal fostering and a lot of animal legislation and lobbying and that kind of thing. Um, my understanding uh, is that every single thing is an equal part of existence on this planet. So I believe, I'm a big believer in what I call alive. The true vibration of the word alive is all life is valued equally. Um, I came into this planet as a full, um, fully activated empath. And uh, in that, I understand my oneness. I understand that everything is me from an applicational, from a quantum multidimensional perspective, um, not just from the human perspective. So what I do is I um, am the, I guess you could call, original receiver of something called Shift into One, which is understanding the human experiment on this planet. So my, um, I, to me, there is no such thing as death. I communicate with my parents. I communicate with my animals just like they're here um, so it's uh, and, and what I do in the work that I do is help people understand the nature of this reality and tap into their quantum nature and the next step in the human um, experiment which in the next step in the human evolution which is stepping into that quantum self which I think is part of understanding that is understanding that we are not there is no such thing as death and we're just moving into the next step of our journey and so that's a lot of, of what I do and whisper is an 18 year old cat who's tapping me on the head she is actually tapping me <laughs> and wants me to pet her so um, and I do believe in having a, a animals the felines actually come from a feline race they actually come from another planet and then they incarnate in this world as um, felines so that they can experience what it is to be in this reality and then they bring that experience back to their home world which is a feline race and they in here what they do for us is they help us to connect to the super our super consciousness so they're a big big part of, of my work <laughs> I always think of my animals put it that way <laughs> yes thank you thank you so much Sandra I so appreciate you being here and whisper being here thank you so much <laughs> now uh, I like to introduce David Dove Fishman who we met on Facebook um, mm -hmm. almost we took a year to the day of when I started my radio show, uh, Dove messaged me on Facebook and he's like, Look, give me a call. Let's talk. And we were on the phone for hours. So, and we co-hosted the show together on Awakening Together Radio. Dove, please introduce yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for inviting me. And as everyone says, it's really an honor to be with all of you on this uh, can you can, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we okay, you froze right. for a second, but you're back. You're back. Okay. Happy happy birthday too, by the way. <laughs> thank okay. you, thank you. Uh, I had spent the the first part of my life. I I was uh, I, I think I, I I put myself in this webinar panel because I I was told that this that that some of the things that that you have in common is maybe the loss of a dear one, whether it's a child. And I was a child who was part of a of a family where the oldest son did uh, uh, was killed in action in World War II. I was five years old at the time, and my mother did spend most of her uh, life grieving that 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 event. And of course, she still had three other children. I was one of the I was the middle one, but. Uh, you know, turning lemons into lemonade, I actually spent the early part of my life very unhappy because basically it wasn't a happy household. And uh, I was meant to find a thing called the Course of Miracles in my 30s. That was about 40 years ago. And um, these days I, I recognize that probably the, the youth that I had spent was the perfect lesson for me to learn to actually look if there's another way of looking at things. And just like almost everyone here has been saying, uh, there really is no death. That, as a matter of fact, as the Course says, uh, swear not to die, uh, child of God. You make a promise you cannot keep. This world is not left by death, but by awakening, awakening to the oneness that is the truth. My my first book was called Into Oneness, um, Thoughts and Prayers on the Way. And it's really my 
understanding of, of the teachings of A Course in Miracles. I myself did have a near-death experience in 1980, uh, in which I did leave my body. I literally, like, without going through the details, I definitely thought that I had died. But as I looked down on the room and on myself, I was completely peaceful being in my right mind. Uh, no f frightened thoughts of, oh my God, I died. Actually, complete peace. So I, 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 bring, I bring that to the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Steph. Thank you. I am so glad. I'm so thankful that you said, hey, throw you in. I was like happy to. Had no no problems. You and I, whenever Dove and I have a talk, it's like we're one mind, just like your organization, foundation, one mind foundation. We're, we're one mind. So thank you so much. Now I'd like to bring in Nikki Hayes. Mwah. I've learned about, I discovered Sandra's work, which shifted into one up in Canada from Nikki. Nikki listened to one of my broadcasts and she contacted me and she's like, you have to have Sandra on your show. <laughs> so Nikki is Sandra's assistant. Uh, actually, she's the executive director of Shift Into One. <laughs> so she, she just found out recently that's what she is. She's the executive director of Shift Into One up in Canada. Nikki, please, please share. Oh, hi. Thank you, Caroline. I hope everyone can hear me. And it's funny because yes. I live by the tenant, um, assisted by Sandra, of uh, nothing happens for no reason. So I am the least um, experienced of all of you of speaking publicly. So this is really interesting. This has happened that I lost connection because I am somewhat nervous, but um, brought into this sort of elite club of, um, of what we're talking about through the death of my son uh, recently, August 30th of this year. So um, what I did find that it, um, I'm a business person uh, in regard to my career. I've spent all my time as a chartered a CPA, as it's called in the States. And um, so for this to happen to me was quite, um, you know, having a curveball thrown, if you will. But what I did find is it was what I might call rubber hit the road. I have never been afraid of death in my head. I have always believed I'm an infinite being. And so what I found the death of my son did was really bring me up right against that. And is that really what I know to be true? And that is what I have found is that it is the truth. And so for me to say my son is dead in a way is a lie because I have a more expansive feeling of him than I've ever had before. And he was going through a dark period. So what I know for sure, he is um, not suffering in any way. So that is um, sort of my experience that I can bring to this and what people might think is a very short period of time to get to this place. It can actually be an instantaneous thing because it happens seamlessly when I know for sure, uppercase K know for sure, that um, he lives on and is, uh, I speak to him all the time, so how could I possibly say he's dead? <laughs> So beautiful. That is so, I was so touched when I received Nikki's email. I received Nikki's email about three weeks after her son Ian had taken his own life. And her strength at three, just, you know, this happened just three weeks ago. Um, and it was sudden. It was unexpected. With me, I was blessed. Um, Kyle was ill for the last three years of his life. Actually, he was, I was told he wasn't going to live in December 2011. And I was blessed with a miracle and had him for two and a half more years. So I had time to prepare for Kyle's transition. Nikki didn't have that. And she's emailing me three weeks after the sudden um, transition of her young son, I think what, Ian was 23? 23. Mm -hmm. 23 years old, and the strength, and just the, the strength of her, and now people tell me all the time the strength of they, they witness in me with Kyle's transition, but you're so close to it, and it was happened so suddenly that I just, oh, my whole, my whole heart just went out to you, and I'm like, that is a true example 
of understanding the truth that there is no death. Because I was, when Kyle did eventually make his transition, I was completely at peace. And people, when I say that, people under, say, how could you be? I understood. I understood at that time. It was a soul agreement that he and I had made. And it was his soul's time. It was his time. We all leave in our time. But there's we leave this physical realm, which is not permanent and is not all there is. There's so, and I knew he was not gone. And he's with me more and more every day. Um, Suzanne told me in our reading that he's my co-host. So he's right here. <laughs> Ian's right here. Steven's right here. Kyle's right here. Um, oh, goodness, Sherry, I can't remember your son's name. Daniel. Daniel. Daniel's, Daniel. And actually, Daniel and Kyle transitioned on the exact same day, not the same year, but the same day, July 1st. Um, July 1st, 2014 for Kyle. July 1st, 2008 for mm -hmm. Daniel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, oh my goodness, I'm so excited. But yes, <laughs> we're going to have such a great, uh, great discussion. The true, the true nature of reality. Like I said, the reason I picked that topic for this um, discussion is because that's what brought me peace. And, and I want to be able to share that with the world. Um, for me, the understanding of certain truths, the understanding of oneness for me was a big um, truth of understanding that we're literally all connected and that science is telling us this. This is not just woo-woo spirituality stuff. Science has proven we are literally all connected. We are literally all one. The truth of who I am, which is a divine light being that can never be separated from God. Never, I can never be separated from anyone on this panel. <laughs> I can never be separated from anyone in the universe. We're all connected. Um, and understanding the truth of who I am as a divine light being and understanding the truth of now in this now moment, that that's all it is. That's all there is, is this now. And whoever listens to this recording in whatever now moment they listen to it, they're going to listen to it at the perfect perfect now time for them and all of these truths that i have come to learn um has changed my life profoundly and that's why i i started this show because once i awoken to those truths i just wanted to share that with the world and so that is why and also um in learning those truths there's a few things i made a few bullet points that i just want to share with my panel and the listeners that learning these truths I live my life now with no fear. Uh, I live my life with unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, unconditional acceptance of all. Doesn't matter what your religion, what your beliefs, doesn't matter any of those things, your color, nothing matters. I know you're one with me. Um, and I have no judgment of anything, no judgment of a person, a place, or a thing total non-judgment and also trying to stay focused and grounded in this now moment where this now is all there is and i accept it and love it and appreciate it and am thankful for every now moment but and it, it brings me the peace that surpasses all understanding and i said i was gonna mute that phone <laughs> okay but i'm gonna i want to um invite um suzanne to share, um, and I'm gonna mute myself while this phone is ringing, <laughs> okay. Do you have a particular question, Caroline, or you just, uh, you want me to talk about, add, add on to the things you just talked about? Add on to that. Well, I hope that your listeners have a chance to experience what you're talking about, because we can all talk all day about these concepts but until you experience that connection it is just talk and it was uh after my susan died i began sitting in the silence daily hoping that that would be the path to me connecting with her my whole goal was to sense her spirit being around and that didn't happen for quite a while but in the meantime i had i started to feel more peaceful I started to open up to other people. I started to feel that connectedness. 
And then I had a few experiences in the silence that weren't so silent. I was hearing voices from, from very wise beings who began to teach me. And it's that personal experience that changes you. And what I realized was that I spent most of my life thinking that I was alone, like most human beings. And that love is something that's outside of us instead of something that is already part of our essential nature. And so I came up with this quote that, that really describes the life of somebody who has awakened to who we really are. And it's awakening is a journey from feeling an emptiness that can never be filled, not by somebody else, not by food, not by drugs, not by anything. And awake, awakening, going from that emptiness that can't be filled to a fullness that can't be contained. I know you guys know what I'm talking about because once you feel that, that love that's already inside, once you realize that the peace that everybody's looking for is already there at another level of our being where we're souls, then sometimes that love just threatens to just overflow and you say, what do I do with all of this? What do I do with it? And that comes from learning that there are two sides to us while we're in human form, the spirit and the human side. We're not either or, we're both. And where we place our focus determines our reality. So you wanted to talk about the nature of reality. It's two sides to us while we're humans making up the oneness. So, 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 so true. Yes, yes. And, you know, actually, um, you, you all have been guest of mine before, and I don't have a list of questions. I, I had, that was the longest introduction I've ever done before. I, I really do the show in the moment now, and if I have a question, it comes up in the moment. So I, 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 what you said was just perfect. I, that's what I want. I want everyone on this panel to share true nature of reality from what resonates with inside of them and, and share that with the world. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. That was perfect on so, so dead on. Anne, can you come in and, and share with us a little bit? Um, I have had a whole different take on uh, death and life after death and suicide since my son, Stephen took his life when he was 15 years old. I wrote a book about it called Stephen Lives uh, because at that time there was such a stigma to suicide and that every parent who had a child that took their life uh, just grieved terribly and didn't even want to talk about it very often. And I was one of the few that would talk about Stephen's death. Um, and I didn't know any other people that had had children that committed suicide. So I was kind of like in the dark that way. And so I did a lot of reading and a lot of studying. And I really believe, as uh, the others have said, there is no death. It's simply a change of form. And it's for the better. But we all hate to think about dying. And so we do everything to hold on to life when, in fact, the other side is uh, there's some wonderful things and it's nothing to be feared. And it's just the continuation of the soul. The soul never dies. The soul is eternal. So when you say your child died, no, your child changed form. Uh, your child let go of the um, little earth suit that they were wearing and transitioned to full spirit. So I have uh, spent my entire life, the last um, 35 years or so, really researching suicide and understanding the state of mind of kids that take their lives. And I heard this mentioned, one of you, I've forgotten who now, that there's there are soul contracts that we're under. And that is really hard to think about when you have a child that took their life, that they may have the potential soul contract for what people need to learn from that experience and what you need to learn from that experience. So I think that, um, as I looked at Stephen's life, and I did not believe he had a soul contract when he first died. I thought he was just hurting so badly that he took his life. In the years that have passed, when I've talked to him, and I've talked to psychic mediums that are just really wonderful, um, I, and he's been brought through, he did have a soul contract. We did. And he had an opportunity to choose to go by suicide, by illness, or by accident. And we talked together. Uh, when we were out of our bodies at night, about how effective it would be uh, to have him take his life 
so that I could learn from it and I could share that with other people because I wasn't ashamed to talk about it. And um, so that's been pretty much my um, experience as far as writing the book. I get, you know, really hundreds of letters from people whose children have taken their lives and they're unconsolable. They are just uh, hurting so badly. They don't understand at all. And I think a lot of books like Sherry's book um, about her son it were really helpful to me and are helpful to so many people. So there are a lot of wonderful writings and tapes and videos out to bring comfort to those who have lost loved ones. And that wasn't true when Stephen took his life in 1974. There was no book, personal book written whatsoever. And um, mine was one of the first, and I think that's probably why Simon and Schuster picked it up, is because it was one of the first books, a personal account of a child who had committed suicide. So I still talk to Stephen every day. I'm doing a lot of investigation with orbs, because I believe that some of the orbs, not all, some of the orbs come from a place where they can bring our children and loved ones to us in that orb or that energy of that orb. And I have, uh, they just gave me a warning on the Mac that I have 96% of my space taken up from photographs of orbs. I have these 96,000 pictures that are taking up a lot of space, but they show, um, that these orbs are really living energies. They're not just specks of dust or whatever. And I believe sometimes Stephen is brought to me in an orb, rarely, but sometimes. And uh, I think it's a wonderful area to study because not a lot of research has been done in that. So many of you have taken, I know I've talked to a couple of you, have taken pictures of orbs. And I think when Suzanne was at our center, at the Logo Center, uh, she and Gary Schwartz were presenting, and afterwards, Gary kind of made a joke about it. He says, oh, orbs, you know, I don't know. And I said, well, just come out. And, you know, I told him how to set the camera up, and he took a bunch of pictures, and all these orbs showed up on the pictures. He said, oh, well, I have to look into this a little bit more fully. So I think there's so many things we don't understand, that there is an intelligence to these orbs, these spheres that come, and that they are from different places, they are for different things, they aren't all the same thing. And it's an exciting field. I, I really want to do some more research and writing on that. So uh, I think this is an exciting field because it really shows us by all the writings and videos all of you do, that death isn't the end. That it's just the change in form and that we can communicate with our loved ones. Die. All of you know this, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but that it, it there's such a great deal of peace and comfort that comes to a parent whose child has died by being able to talk to them or being able to have these orbs appear and you know it's them and they talk to you from these orbs and um, and having psychic mediums that can tune in and get so much information about our loved ones who died. So I think it's one of the most exciting fields ever to be in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Anne. And it was I, it was I who said I know when Kyle transitioned that uh, we had a so that's why I was at peace. Actually, actually uh, the the day that Kyle transitioned, um, I was at the hospital for over a month by myself. But the day that they were taking him off life support for the last time, and um, uh, some family members came, um, when they took him off and Kyle actually transitioned. I was very calm and very at peace. I had to calm uh, uh, my cousin who broke down and she's like, wait a second, I should be, you know, she thought it should be, the role should be switched. I should be the one breaking down and, I, and she should be comfort, comforting me, but I was comforting her because I knew. i have been reading uh, Robert Schwartz's book, Soul, Your Soul's Plan and your soul's gift and i knew that kyle and i had that soul contract i knew because we actually went through it twice we went through it in 2011 and in 2014. so i believe somewhere um in 2011 we we went up into spirit and said okay i'm not quite ready yet so let's give her a little more time and then <laughs> I, I truly believe that <laughs> okay thank you so so much so i like to bring i like to bring in sherry now um for her her comments on okay um i think it's very funny because Anne, you know when we we all have different abilities and when we were out when i was out visiting you in arizona Anne said, let's take some photographs and get some orbs. And Anne got all the orbs. And I shot in the very same direction. And my camera didn't pick them up. 
So I know I think it's very interesting how we all have our abilities often in different areas. Um, starting in April, I started recording EVPs and it progressed so quickly that I'm now doing readings for other parents, bringing them in via the cell phone. And all I can say is, I think this is the most exciting chapter of work I've ever done, and the cell phone is coming. And I will be in Arizona in September, and I am going to be teaching as many parents as want to, or not just parents, anybody, um, how to do this because it's not really complicated if I can do it. And bottom line is these kids want this. I get more EVPs of the children saying, I can call you, mom, call me, I'm on the phone. I got one just yesterday in a reading where they said, we've created the phone. And I think that they want this every bit as much as we do. And so I'm going to work very hard to get people involved so that they can eventually just do what I'm doing, which is you click on that recorder, you put on that background sound, and now with my own son, Danny, I don't have to ask him a question. I just think it. And then when I play it back, he's going over everything. And it's a phone. I mean, it's, we're using the computers, but the cell phone is going to happen. And I'm, I'm so excited about all these developments because I have believed in the presence of spirit since I was 20. And spirit doctors healed me. And it's been a long journey. And people still think I'm kind of out of my mind. But um, we're the fortunate ones because we have this knowledge and it enriches our lives. And the amount of love I get from Danny through these communications makes me swoon. I mean, sometimes I just break down and enjoy so much emotion that he has too. And I've gotten in trouble from posting on Facebook that my son says he misses me because, you know, we have a lot of moms in this bereavement movement who would like to believe that their children are now angels and have literally no human emotions. They're above it. They're just in bliss at every second. And I got chewed out for writing on my Facebook page that Danny said he missed me because it upset a mom who wanted to believe that her child was in constant bliss. And um, I'm just thrilled to have the communication. And I think that they want it and we want it because love is what rules. And so um, I'm, I think there's a lot of great development and I will be working to help others learn to get on that soul phone. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you. Yes, yes. I, I am so excited about the soul phone. Um, I know that, the, I know, like I said, I have never heard the term EVP until Susan he sent my audio off to Dr. Gary Schwartz. And when she did that, she used the term EVP. I'm like, what's that? And then I started doing research on it. And I'm like, oh, I'm so excited because I definitely, I want to be one one of the first parents to have a cell phone because I know it's coming and I know Dr. Gary and so many other people are working on it. And I, I could see it coming in within 50 years. Oh, I, no, 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 much sooner. Sooner than that, okay. I'm going to be teaching in September and I'm going to set it. I want people to bring their laptops to the conference. I want us to get them set up and doing it by the time they go home. Okay. Because it's what the kids want too. It's what spirit wants too. They're, they're working very hard on that yes. side yes. to make the signal clearer. So I think it's, it's time has come. I'm so glad. Suzanne, come in. I, I think you want to, yes, come in. Yes, Suzanne. Um, you're on mute. Yes, yes, yes. No, oh, I think that some of your listeners may not understand what EVP is. It stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. That's yes. all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. And that was just, a, that was such an awesome gift. I mean, the reading that Suzanne gave me was amazing in itself, but the, the extra gift of the EVP, Kyle's voice, you could hear it. I love Suzanne's reaction. When I told her, listen here, she's like, what? You can literally hear his voice and everybody could hear Coco. And so that was just, ah, oh, that was just an, an amazing gift. Oh, and I you. wanted to add what amazed me about that was that Susan didn't 
wasn't trying to procure EVT in my understanding. <laughs> was like, Kyle must have been up to some pretty fancy footwork to break through without it being a planned act in any way on our end. So it's, it's phenomenal. Yes. It is. When she was, during the reading, I kept saying, are, are you hearing this interference? And she says, I can't hear it. And I said, I can, until suddenly it was clear that her son was doing it. And, uh, and, I, and I said, he's messing with us here. And then when I listened to the recording afterwards, I actually, a little, few little holy curse words came out of my mouth, you know, because I was so stunned by the cloud. I, I heard the dog bark. I heard yes. the doggy bark as well because Caroline <laughs> sent it to me. It's yes. 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 And what's funny too is Suzanne said, cut it out. <laughs> she, was like, she didn't know what was going on because this is the first time this had happened with her. And she's like, cut it out. Yes. And I said, Kyle, I'm trying to concentrate here. Will you cut out this? <laughs> Very funny. It really is. <laughs> that is so, it was so wonderful. It's so wonderful. So I, I, I want, I'd like to bring in Sandra now. Sandra, come in, please, with your thoughts, please. Wow. Um, I, thank you guys for sharing that. That's mm -hmm. really spectacular. I wasn't sure what EVP, EVP standed for, so thank you. And that explains a lot. And I love the con the concept of from cell phone to soul phone that is very very cool i think um what i did want to mention is it makes a lot of sense to me uh, i uh, carolyn you had mentioned this the time that you had interviewed me and and now they have a little bit more background information it makes a lot of sense to me that this is happening now because we're at a specific we're at a point in our vibration collectively where the um the energy the veil is is thinner so we are now able to cross that line and we are now starting to use what I call consciousness technology as opposed to technology technology God technology or consciousness technology which we are becoming our own um, computer and developing our own technology through consciousness which is which we are the greatest computer of all the human form and what we have the capacity to do at uh, 10 years ago even five years ago this would not be possible because the veil was not that thin and now it's at the point where we're able to do that so I think it's absolutely phenomenal where we're crossing that bridge in in this way I, I, is extraordinary so I, I wanted to add to I want to add that and it makes a lot of sense when you understand when we look at the human experiment and we're at the end we are at the very end now of this experiment we're kind of like you know, we've rounded third base and we're kind of sliding into home mm -hmm. and home is a capital h and um so so we're doing all these all these things are happening to to help us get there there are so many things the internet was a is a huge tool i'm sure i don't have to tell you guys that i'm sure you guys have had all kinds of experiences through the internet in which you've experienced some sort of divine information coming through the internet that is just for you and nobody else i'm you know looking i had an experience where i um looked on the internet got some information went back the next day to try and find it not there Couldn't find it <laughs> completely gone and so the internet served as that but this sounds like it's a step up and as we, as we are moving closer and closer to the end of the experiment this makes a lot of sense we everybody who is here on the planet at this time in our evolution I'm sorry if my computer is moving my cat Tara is rubbing her face and she's knocking my monitor <laughs> but um, as uh, as we are everybody who is living on the planet now this is our last incarnation on this planet this is the end of our uh, of because the planet is ascending the planet is moving to the next realm and we have the opportunity to do that with her we came in with the experiment we entered with her and we have the opportunity to leave with her and, and when I say we came in with her that's through many 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 incarnations all of us have been here many many times over and this is our last um, opportunity um, as she is going she is going with or without us. She's going. So this. So we're pulling out. All the stops are being pulled, basically, to give us every single opportunity to make this quantum leap. It's it's a quantum leap, uh, and I keep going back to understanding our quantum nature because that is our true nature. We are we are pure positive potential, um, and in it's tapping into that I am presence. So we all step into becoming who Jesus and Buddha, um, Allah, we all become that. This is where we're moving. So this uh, soul phone is very cool because it's something that it's a great 
um, interface that helps those who may not be so open to it, it's it's just a, a step to help those that are a little bit reluctant to move into something that's a little bit more it's not quite over there it's in between and it can take them over there so what an amazing tool that can be so kudos thank you you're welcome so so true thank you thank you sandra thank you and we are going to come back because i have some questions for you well i'll come back to you on that okay i'd like to bring um dove dave fishman for you uh, yes okay thank you so much uh listening to all of you has been really a wonderful experience and i i also did not know what a um, EVP, but thank you so much. Um, actually, uh, as Caroline said, uh, I started a foundation a number of years ago called One Mind Foundation, which is the understanding that we are all of one mind. Of course, in the illusion, uh, it, it, I call it the illusion. It's it's the it's it's the it's the ego's way of seeing the belief in separation as real. But in truth, we are one, and exactly as, as Sandra knows stands stands for. And I, I, I love your acronym, Alive. Uh, all life is valued equally, and and it's in that seeing that equality, that sameness, rather than seeing differences, that we actually can remember the peace of God that does pass all under understanding. Uh, as the Course of Miracles says, peace, even though we all want it does have one condition and and peace is the key to the kingdom in other words the key to remember what you are you can only remember yourself when your mind is still and is one and is open and and the one condition necessary for that is seeing sameness or equality so uh, uh, all life <laughs> is valued equally is, is really the key to that um, and that's really a good way to also even see in, in parents and children, uh, you know, in this world of illusion, and it really is illusion, uh, when you value one person more than another, maybe we value that which we seem to have lost, some, somebody that we lost more than what we have, we're really actually not seeing all things as equal we're seeing well i lost something that's really important to me and you know maybe the the what i still have is not as valuable and of course that's the upside down way that actually my my birthday lesson in the course of miracles is i will not value what is valueless what's valuable belongs to me so it's to begin to recognize that that that, that i am grateful for the eternal life that I have, and that all have the same. But when I am seeing one thing is, you know, well, that is something that's a terrible thing that has happened, and well, you know, uh, I wish it didn't happen, I am, I'm then going into the belief in separation that, that I could lose something that has value, and now I am less valuable, I am less worthy. So we start to value our grievances rather than to actually value the, the, the gratitude and the appreciation of all that we are given. And as I say, all are given all. One of my uh, mantras is we live in a sea of synchronicity, in a sea of synchronicity where everything is given. That's probably why the EVP exists, because everything is given to you. All you have to do is ask. We are all of one mind. Speaking up on what Suzanne said, uh, yeah, to, to, we're speaking in concepts. And unless somebody is experiencing this, this is all words, symbols, concepts. And, you know, to believe a concept is really not what, what, what anyone is here for. It's to experience this oneness. But I, I also believe that to have an open mind is so, so important because when our mind is closed and say, well, exactly, I think, I forgot who it is that, that said, maybe it was Sherry, that, that actually said, uh, well, I don't know, those people are really deluded. Uh, your willingness, that's a key word, willingness to be open 
And if you're open, yes, more people from science are saying it, more people from, from the spiritual side are saying it. That's, that's why there is a conference called uh, Science and Non-Duality Conference out once a year in San Jose. Uh, scientists and spiritual people are all saying the exact same thing. Uh, the introduction to A Course of Miracles, it says this entire course can be summed up in these few lines. So you have 1,300 pages in the course, and he tells you, the author of the course tells you, the entire course can be summed up in these few lines. That which is real cannot be threatened. That which is unreal doesn't exist. Herein lies the peace of God. So when we're worried about the things that we have lost or, or I'm afraid I'm going to lose something, we're, we're actually deluding ourselves to be willing. And the word is willing to be open and say, I do not know what anything is for. I do not know if I believe in death, I am, I'm believing in something that is not real, but okay, I think it's real. So I, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So we close our mind down. And when we close our mind down, we get into a place called fear. And in the place of fear, and I, I love what Caroline said at the beginning, she says, I am fearless. I mean, all healing is really basically the release from, from fear. If you're fearless, you're, you, you are healed. You are awake. When you're dreaming and you're into the belief that the death is real, you're, you are in fear. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you again for mentioning One Mind. The name of my first book is called uh, Into Oneness, and the second book is called um, The Open Mind, Loving Yourself. And actually, there's only one self. It's not that you're loving this self. I'm certainly not this self. None of us are this form. We all recognize that form is not real. We are the one mind, to love the one mind, which contains and extends to all, all included equally. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Dove. That is so, so true. And, and I always say, I always say on my show, and I'm sure you've all heard, heard me say, I like to keep it simple. <laughs> I know that science has proven that we're interconnected and they have all these uh, scientific equations and stuff that I like. Oh, I don't understand any of that, but I do understand oneness. I do understand that we're all connected, we're all one, and that this world is an illusion, that separation is an illusion. That was the, 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 the sentence in What the Bleep that woke me up to the truth of oneness was, the biggest problem in the world today is the illusion of separateness, thinking that we're separate. That's why if we think we're separate, we feel we can hurt one another when all we're doing is hurting ourselves. What we do to another, we're literally doing to ourselves. And so it's like once the world wakes up to that simple truth, there will be peace on earth. Yeah, it's very, very simple. I'd like to invite Nikki in now. Nikki, please come in and share with us. just have to remember to turn that mute off. Um, wow, every single thing that each person has spoken of uh, has resonated with me in some way, and, and, and Dove, I think. Um, even, I have never done the course, but the, I do have a phrase, infinite patience in, uh, creates immediate results, which is always comforting to me because I know I always get to that, so why not get there quicker <laughs> and just go there? <laughs> And what I found with, um, and I'll just speak because um, we could, this conversation, which I do hope helps have it lasting and daily and people talking about death more. Um, I think what really got me to a point of peace and patience was um, understanding my biggest fear with the whole thing is what Anne mentioned, which is suicide, which taking all the emotional charge out of it. Suicide is when someone takes an action personally to end their life. And that's it. And we attach all this emotion to it. And as soon as someone says suicide, you can see their whole body change. They think, oh, that's too bad. And you know, no, it's what happened. And I think when you speak about me working with Sandra, um, I am the executive director of the company of two. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that 
I so resonated with what her understanding of the true nature of reality was and how it helped me embrace all that Ian was to me and continues to be to me that um, I was able to look at the emotion that was overwhelming me that wasn't allowing me to appreciate just a minute here. I had this relationship with this being that I brought into the world. We did do the work that we had to do together and he left in perfect time. And I'm here in this perfect time to continue. So um, every single thing that all of you have said gives me such a deep appreciation that every single thing I've done in my life has brought me to this point that I can even be with all of you because if Ian hadn't have died, I'd have no reason to even have connected with you to understand this. So um, deep appreciation for all of that. And I think what I wanted to make sure that I did here was not be a victim to all of this. So um, my big fear at Ian's funeral, because my ex-husband is Catholic and suicide is like, oh my God, Ian may not even get to heaven. So um, what Sandra helped me with, because we had his funeral at a Catholic church, I was very afraid of getting faced with the emotional charge from everyone of um, me not being strong enough to just say to them, it's okay. So we came up with this phrase whenever anyone came up to me and said, I'm so sorry, and I would feel their emotion. I just looked at them and said, thank you so much. That means so much to me. And it validated whatever was happening for them. And I didn't have to get absorbed into their um, charge, if you will, or their emotion. So um, I, I just have found this tremendous uh, peace that I have found by knowing we are infinite. So don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but um, it's just something I wanted to share. Just wanted to share, Carolyn, a quote that I remember. Yes, our children died, but first they lived. And I think that when we've had a suicide in particular, but any kind of a death of anyone or a child, we forget that first they lived, whether they lived a few days or they lived 50 years, first they lived. And we tend to concentrate on the death, the type of death, how they pulled the whole thing instead of first they live. Let's look at their life. First they live. That moment in time when they took their life or they died is just a moment in time. And I think we forget about that. That is so true, Anne. So true, Anne. And Nikki, what you shared is is so so amazing. And and it's true what both Anne and, and Nikki said is so true is um I know that every transition is timely. Every transition is perfect time because every moment is all there is is the now moment and every now moment is perfect. So they came and did what they needed to do. Sometimes a life, a soul might plan to incarnate for a few days or a few hours. Um, that's that soul's plan. And, and we have to, we can't, we just have to honor and love. It's all about just loving in that now moment that that soul came and we had this soul agreement and we had this soul plan and we shared this time together. So now I'm honoring it. I know you're not gone because I know Kyle, Kyle's right here. Danny's right here. Steven's right here. Ian's right here. We're all right here. Um, Susan, um, I forget, Suzanne, your, your stepdaughter's name. What's her? I can't hear you. You're... Unmute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, I'm Suzanne and she's Susan. Susan. Oh, okay. Susan. Okay. That's, you know what? That, I think that's why I can never remember her name. I had, I had a reading with a medium once before I knew that I was going to be a medium. And she says, I don't understand. There's this young girl here and she keeps giving me your name. She see, keeps saying, I'm Susan. I'm Susan. And I said, no. <laughs> well, I know. We know that they're all here. They're not gone. And when you know that, it's such a it is a joyful and the other thing they feel what we feel they feel so if we're crying every day they feel that and that's hurting them if we're laughing and joyous and every day i joke around with kyle all the time i talk to him all the time i joke with him all the time he loves that because he knows that I, I i know that he's not gone and that's what they want us to know yes yes sandra I just um I just wanted to say you know when we we're talking when Anne when you were talking about um or you 
Caroline, I'm not sure who was who said it, but when we talked about, you know, if that's their sole contract, they're here, and then they live, whether they've lived 24 hours or, you know, 24 days or 24 years, uh, it, this goes back to the sole contract, which I think, Anne, you might have been the one to mention that, um, because we all have a contract, and, and it really goes down to that, and that contract may not be what we are conditioned to believe it should be, that we, you know, we're born, we should live these long lives get married have children that the typical um, what's considered normal in um, in this reality and I think I did I just drop no okay um, on my screen is just dropped but I'm going to continue to go anyway um, so it, it's what we consider to be normal in this reality and it's absolutely not it's according to the contract that we um, have signed and that contract is based on all of the other lifetimes we've had and what is the best uh, what is the best um, situation we can create for ourselves in moving forward because our life is about our soul evolution and again you all know this our life is about our soul evolution it's not about the experience necessarily that we're having here in this moment it's about how we how we are um, offering this experience up to our soul's growth which is what um, is part of our soul contract our soul contract has has all of the information about every lifetime that we've ever lived so it's basically um, the keeper of that information and part of our soul contract is you know we, we decide before we come here you know who we're where we're born what gender we're born into what skin color what country what our education level is going to be who we are going to possibly marry who we are going to divorce all of that stuff is all part of our soul contract and that may sound um, almost uncompassionate you know it, it may sound very uh, uh, very matter-of-fact but it is at that level of awareness it is the absolute um, truth and I think when people do see the light and see the tunnel and they have that life review that they talk about that's about reviewing the soul contract so I just wanted to put that out there Hi, thank you so much, Sandra. Um, when you were speaking, it inspired me to, to share this. The uh, question uses a different expression other than soul contract. It says the script is already written. The script is already written. So, and, and it says one other thing about, about death, that no one dies without their consent, that no one dies without their consent. So you can see the script is already written. And the purpose of, of this world or this dream, this movie that we've made, is actually to learn the lessons that we have all come here for. So everyone is touched by everything. You know, when somebody passes, everybody's touched, everyone in the family, the friends, every, you know. So everyone learns the lessons that we have come here for. The, the, the idea of oneness or union, that there is no separation, is the idea that, that we are beginning to recognize that, that, that we are one and that, that, that the idea that someone leaves, whether it's, it's if they leave to a distant country or they, or they leave by leaving the planet, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, Larry Dossie, Dr. Larry Dossie, who Caroline has uh, had as a guest on, on her uh, show, Awaken to Oneness, uh, he, he is a medical doctor. He, his latest book is called One. Uh, the whole idea of, of union and one, he also uh, is, is a medical doctor that goes around teaching at medical schools, the interns, about the power of prayer, the power of prayer. He was, he was on uh, the Oprah show and, and uh, he was talking about how he teaches young doctors, interns, before they go into practice about the power of prayer. And, and Oprah said to him, well, well Dr. Dossi, you know, I know what you teach, but what do you say when you are going into surgery and there's, and there's a major operation? What do you say? What is your prayer? He says, I only have one prayer. Thy will be done. Because the script is written. There is a soul contract. It isn't that we can change anything. You know, the idea that I'm going to go out and change the world, you can't change the world, but we can change our mind about what the world is. The world is an outside picture of our own inner condition. As we begin to recognize our own oneness, as we begin to realize that there is, that there is communication at always, that, 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 that love is communication. There's, there's a line of the Course that says, 
the function of love is one. For the function of love is one. Here in this world, we think love is an emotion. Well, I love you, and you know, hopefully you love me back. No, that's the ego's version of love. The oneness is the love of God, that all are created equal, all are included, li literally alive, all live uh, all life is valued equally. Nothing is ever gone or left. Uh, in my counseling, I, I have people who, who basically have are grieving, and whenever uh, I meet somebody who who basically you know has a recent loss, I never heard of EVP, but uh, Richard Bach, the author of Jonathan Livingston Seagull and the book Illusions, almost everybody knows Jonathan Livingston Seagull and Illusions, but he's written a number of books. One of them is called There Is No Such Place as Far Away. And it's a very small book. It can't be more than 50, 60 pages. Most of it is watercolor. But in the, in the, in the core of the book, he says, if you think somebody's separated by time or distance, that they're not in your life anymore, just bring them into the center of your mind. Bring them into the center of your mind. And your experience with that person, whatever you're saying, whatever you're experiencing, is your experience if they were right here in the room with you. Now, I know the, the body form says, well, how is that possible? I can't put my arms around them. But, this, but the experience you have, the oneness that you have with whoever it is, is always going to be there. And as Caroline says, I'm always joking with Kyle. I'm always, you know, he loves it. I'm happy. He's happy, you know, and that's God's will for us is perfect happiness. So there's only one will. It's not there's two wills. It's always perfect happiness. Thank you so much for letting me share, Caroline. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Dove. Thank you. Susan, um, Susan had a question. I just want, um, I planned this to be about two hours because of so many wonderful panel guests, but Susan, if you have to leave early, it's okay. Um, would you like to share? Um, something before you leave, if you have to leave early. No, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood that it was an hour, and I'm and I I'll probably slip out of here early. I'm loving every minute here. Oh, time. okay. Yeah. No. With all with all this this with this great panel, an hour just would not do. Okay. <laughs> so, but if you do have to slip out early, it's okay. We'll understand. Um, thank you so much. But yeah, um, as to to um, comment on what uh, Dove said about. Um, doc, Dr. Dossie's prayer, I always say, I have one prayer, and that's thank you. Because I know in every now moment, it's perfect. Everything is already perfect. So my one prayer is thank you. But I love, I love having doc, Dr. Dossie. Um, Dr. Dossie, he was amazing. Um, I've had wonderful guests. I'm just overwhelmed. Yes, yes, Nikki, share. Um, just something David was saying I wanted to add briefly is responsibility. So I, before Ian's death, I had been talking from working with Sandra about taking 100% responsibility for my life, really shifting from spirituality to consciousness, and my consciousness creating my reality. So you can appreciate um, in our society, the programming, the worst that can happen is a child dying before their parents. So then I'm, what the F, like, why would I create that? So then I'm faced with so many people saying, well, there's no way you would be responsible for that. So what I did, uh, did and with Sandra's help for sure, um, was allow for that. I may not understand it, but I'm going to allow for it, and I'm going to stay open to it. And like um, if anyone's familiar with Ho'oponopono, a Dr. Hugh Lam that took full responsibility for violent patients. And he was just said, I am responsible. May not be able to explain it, but I'm going to take responsibility. And the patients were healed, left the hospital. So um, I just wanted to touch on that note because that's a very hot, hot issue. And uh, very difficult, but I felt comfortable with this group, obviously, to uh, address it. So thank you. Carolyn, I wanted to address a little bit more the EVP because I was involved in it in the early 70s when it was called paranormal voice recording and worked with a scientist uh, for four years in Washington, D.C. And we picked up, it was really in its beginning stages. They even had a microphone in a tree trunk to try to cancel out all noises to bring through those in spirit more fully. And how it's evolved from the 70s until now and the great work Sherry's doing 
morning, I uh, listen on her uh, site of the prayer registry to the children's voices that come through, and it's incredible work. We never got stuff like that back in the 70s. The Lamoureux brothers were researching it and got many voices, and one night I was so tired. We'd get up at 3 in the morning, listen for a couple of hours for voices and ask questions, and in my mind, I just thought, I can't do this any longer. I'm going to quit. I'm too tired. And a voice came back on the tape when we played it back. Don't quit. Don't quit. And so we continued that research and still do that. And I love that Sherry's taking it a step, a 10 steps higher and the wonderful work she's doing with that. It's just amazing. Also, I wanted to, we are so much um, based on the Edgar Cayce readings. Uh, he was, uh, those of you that don't know, he was one of the greatest mystics of our time. And uh, he died in the, the 40s. But he said in one of his readings, there is almost never, never an accident. All this is part of soul contracts and planning or words to that effect. And I think we forget about that and think, you know, I, I was in a meeting of grieving parents and it just made me nauseous. One of, one of them, and then Cerebral said, oh, well, it's different. Your child killed themselves, so you don't understand. He had a choice. My child didn't have a choice. He was killed in an accident or whatever, and that's just so untrue. We have soul contracts, and uh, I love Rob Schwartz. He spoke at a conference that we did, uh, and he's just charming, and his book's Your Soul's Plan. I know, Carolyn, you're very familiar with this in Your Soul's Gift. There's some wonderful truth and information in that about the planning that goes on and how few things are accidents at all, and that there's this wonderful tapestry that is constantly being woven um, to connect it all back up. And so, I am just really excited about the, the work that Sherry's doing because it's so evidential. It has such potential. And also, uh, I'm excited about uh, the fact that we all can communicate with our loved ones who've died. We're not making it up. And, and I use this quote from the scriptures where Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration spoke to dead people. He spoke to Moses and Elijah who were dead. And people, you know, others there saw them. And so... When people say, oh, I can't do that, that's maybe of the devil, and, and we get that a lot as ministers, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, this is of the devil, I can't follow that kind of thing, but in fact, there's such an incredible amount of research and information, and Gary Schwartz is doing really amazing work, and uh, so it's, you just can't deny this kind of thing, so we're, we're excited to be on the cutting edge of all this, all of us. Thank you so much. That is so true. This, and like I said, I never heard of it until I experienced it. And like Suzanne and, and Dove mentioned, it is about experience. And also, when um, when we we all have experienced some loss, we have not uh, transitions, major transitions, and those transitions have elevated our souls. There, so everything that happens happens for our highest good. Our highest good, whether we, we, it's hard for us to see that from a limited human perspective, but from the soul perspective, it happens for our highest good. And um, yes, Sherry, yes. I will add to that, that um, I was so very, very sick in 1969 when I was 18. I was literally hemorrhaging to death from very bad Crohn's disease. And my mother, who was so distraught, uh, a nurse came up to her and said, oh, someday, you're going to see something's going to come from all of this. And my mom said to me, I looked at her and said, nothing good will ever come from this kind of suffering. And yet it is because of being pushed so very, very far with illness that my mind opened. We talk about the open mind. I did not, it was not a faith healing in that it wasn't, I believe, because I didn't believe in anything. I was raised in a home where the father was atheist and the mother was agnostic. They were cultural Jews, but they were not, there was no spirituality whatsoever in the home. And had I not experienced the most amazing amounts of energy that were being directed to me through the ethers from a man who began the process in Britain to a young girl sitting in New Jersey, uh, I would never have believed it in a million years. That brought me to realize that there was so much more going on than what I could see, feel, or touch, that the five physical senses could not see 
the source of the energy and yet I got well and my blood tests reversed and I'm well today at 65. And so it, it's all just whatever brings you to it. I was well involved in this long before I lost my son. But when Danny passed, I knew exactly what I had to do, you know, in order to connect up with him. And it was a real leg up. And so, you know, I think that I never realized when I first got into all of this, it was more fascination. I'd been healed. I was aware that there was an invisible world and I wanted in, I wanted to know. But when I lost my son so many years later, or say he transitioned, that's when I realized the benefit to all of us who understand about this. Of course we suffered. I mean, you know, of course we, we, we find out, you, know, you find your child not breathing anymore and the mammal side of you, the non-spirit part of you is in pain. You know, we did, to say there's no loss, you can say it, but you know, the potential of what they might have been, the, the life you might have had had they gone on, of course we feel that. Any parent, anyone will who loves someone. But as I say to the parents I counsel, okay, what's the next best thing? Like I call that connecting up. You connect up through the common denominator, which is we are spirit incarnate. We are spirit incarnated into flesh and they are discarnate spirit, but we're all spirit. And, you know, and that's, that's the common denominator. And so that's what really is what heals because that's permanent. And as impermanent as this whole world is, the spirit, will go on and Danny proves it to me every day you know I, I understand the spirit realm to be a very active place with much learning going on but he must be able to split himself up in pieces because all I have to do is click on the recorder and he's right there almost as if he's in wait for me so I know I don't understand it all I'm always learning because I get EVPs that I recorded say on a Monday and then I'm auditing it on a Wednesday. And just as I go to open my front door to let in the computer fellow who helps me, an EVP comes on that says, your Josh is here. <laughs> but I made the recording three days before. So I'm, I'm really learning that the nature of time is just part of this physical dimension. And there's just so much we can't experience. But I love what Dove said, just open your mind. You don't have to have certainty. And we probably won't have total certainty because the doubting mind likes to doubt, you know. But if you open your mind, you will get experiences that will confirm whether it's the way Anne gets these amazing orbs. However it comes to you, open your mind, it will come. So true. Oh, yes, Dove, yes. I was just going to comment quickly on what Sherry just said, yes, that is so true. It's so, and it's true about experience, and that's what, Spirit is leading us to these experiences so we can know internally what, what, you, just ex, what, what you just said, basically. So true. Go ahead, Dove. Um, yeah, actually, listening to Sherry, I, I recall one of the clearest messages that I ever received. And, and of course, by the way, uh, you know, now we're talking about electronic voice phenomena. Uh, even though it doesn't use that particular, it uses a word called trust, T-R-U-S-T, -T, which I have an acronym for, which was given to me by a lady, Janine Jansma, T-R-U-S-T, -T, to rely upon spirit totally. And the key word there is totally, because that's what t a trust is. If, if, I'm, I'm, if I'm saying, well, I rely on spirit for some things, but some things I'm going to handle on my own, that's distrust that's that's the belief that you're still separate and spirit is out there and i'm over here and I'll, I'll i'll control a little on my own to rely upon spirit totally i i went through a bout of cancer back in 2013 and after uh after each week's session of chemo i actually wound up in a hospital because my immune system had been really brought down big time and i had to be brought back up and, and in a hospital and I, I really, my only experience in the hospitals was when I was a kid, I had my tonsils out. So I, I went through my whole life without going to the hospitals. And even being at that hospital, I probably wouldn't have been in it except my wife said to me, as I was under the covers at 102 fever, she said, David, if you go to sleep, you're probably not going to wake up. Do you want to die? I said, no. 
said, well, let's go to the hospital and let's check in with the emergency. So what I thought they were going to do with the emergency ward is to, you know, give me an antibiotic or something to, to, to get me back so the fever would be down. They took one look at my immune system and said, no, 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 you're not leaving this hospital. My immune system was at one and minimum is five. They have to bring you up between five and ten. So every day the doctor would come in and say, oh, you, you're definitely getting better. Like one, It's 1.6, 2.2. 2.8 so but the third or fourth day i'm saying holy spirit i know i'm getting better but what is all this for like like why am i going through why am i in a hospital you know what's this for and the moment i asked it was the clearest communication that i've ever really received from spirit as, as clear as i'm speaking right now it said you are perfectly cared for you are perfectly cared for. And the, mo the moment I heard it, I realized that that's the truth. I, I'm being totally taken care of in this wonderful hospital, wonderful doctors. I'm on Medicare. I'm not paying anything. And I'm perfectly cared for, literally. I said, my God. And I realized at that moment that I didn't totally trust. Because if I totally trusted, I wouldn't even be asking, what is this for? If I totally trusted, everything would be perfect exactly the way it is. Exactly as you say, Caroline. Everything happens perfectly. Everything happens for the good. But I now recognize that we are all perfectly cared for. You know, the idea of, of death in the Course of Miracles, just to give you a little background on what it says about death, death is really nothing more than an attack on the love of God. Of course, God didn't create death. You know, when you go to a funeral, you're standing at the grave, and it says, well, God giveth and God taketh away. Well, that's a lie. God doesn't giveth you life for 70 80 years and then take us away no, no, no. that's the that's the dream of an attack and, and and very clear not everyone's going to accept this but the world is not as as the bible says in genesis but in genesis he does use creation twice he, he does creation for seven days and then he does it again for seven days very few people do not recognize that in genesis there's two creations but the world that we made, this world of differences, is not the love of God. Love of God is oneness, is for the function of love is one. So we made this world basically as an attack on the love and the integrity of God. And so death is the greatest symbol of there is no love. I mean, because if, if God loves you, why would, why would you die? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I do invite anyone who's never heard of A Course of Miracles, you know, to even look at the lessons, there's 365 lessons. If you do one a day, you can't do more than one a day. It would take you a year. It's a good way to train your mind to see things differently. Because the way we see things with our physical eyes and our physical ears is not telling you the truth. And the, and the theme here is what is reality? What is the truth? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. Yes, Suzanne had the, she, um, I guess I, I wasn't good at uh, conveying that this is a two-hour program today. <laughs> so she had other time constraint things, but oh, she was amazing. Um, we loved having her and I'm just so thankful. And Sandra, let's, I, I think also, Sandra, I have a question for you. Um, okay. You were talking about the human experiment. Now, I, I understand I, from your, your um, website, I understand what you mean, but maybe the listeners and the, the, the viewers, because this is video now, <laughs> maybe the viewers, can you explain what you mean when you talk about the human experiment? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, great. And that actually lends itself well into what I put my hand up for anyway. So you were reading my one mind. <laughs> <laughs> the human experiment. Um, understand all, all of humans um, are an experiment, just like everything. Uh, whisper here is also an experiment. Anything that strays from source, the oneness of all that is, is an adventure in consciousness. So there is a human experiment. There will be other forms of experiments with other beings, um, what we may refer to as ETs. Um, this cat that's going beyond, across from me, she's also um, conducting her own experiment. Um, but the human experiment, what humans are here to do, and I guess she wants to sit on my
my lap. I'm just gonna nurture off. Um, okay, so what humans are here to do is experience emotions. We are an, an emotional energetic experience experiment, or E4 as I call it. And that's what we're here to do. Now that's the jewel that humanity offers up to source. Every specific everything that ventures from source that strays from source has something to offer up the jewel that humanity has is our capacity to feel our capacity to be to, have, to experience emotions at the end of the day that is all we offer up we don't offer our body we offer our emotions up and in that emotional a lot of people talk about akashic records when we incarnate back we're basically looking at our emotional bank account our emotional charge bank account and when we reincarnate we are taking all of that into consideration as part of our soul contract to um, to determine what it is we need to he to do here in order to clear karma karma is what I refer to as an emotional charge account and it's basically a, um, a an account in which we are learning to clear in this being our last lifetime we are here to clear our karmic account and get us back to zero point that's that neutral a uh, zero point which is that dark you know that dark void that dark matter when you get to zero point you go quantum okay so you, you go from being non uh, a non quantum to a quantum being and that's what we're doing here and the, the extraordinary thing about this time period in our in in our existence is not only are we clearing this lifetime we are clearing every single lifetime that's why we're able to tap in now to these other lifetimes which leads me to what i want to talk about with um which i was which came to me from your um your discussion sherry and that is i want to talk about two things and that is um parallel lives and time the concept the construct of time here we are in third and fourth dimension fourth dimension is where we experience our thoughts emotions and beliefs that's where we start to question our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs. That's where we start to realize, wait a second, just as we have a physical body that I can touch, I also have an emotional body, I have a mental body, I have a, um, a causal body, I have a karmic, that's where the karma is, that's where the emotional intensity, that's where all of that gets stored and we collect or, or correct, clear or accumulate karma. So when we have, when Sherry, you were speaking about um, your son leaving, there is another reality in which you are experiencing your son still at this point. So just because he's gone in this lifetime doesn't mean he's gone in other lifetimes, depending on our contract. So for every single choice we make that creates a, um, a lot of emotional intensity, there's a shoot off. So for instance, let's say you're thinking about, okay, um, you have two proposals. Let's say you're a female, you have a proposal from Frank and you have a proposal from Tony and you're, and you love them both, but for different reasons and you don't know who to get married to and you decide, okay, I'm going to get married to Frank. I'm not... I and you say no to Tony. So let's say, you know, 10 years down the line, you're married to Frank and you have a dream and Tony's in the dream. And you think, oh my God, you wake up and you think, oh my God, what was I thinking about Tony? What, what, um, you know, where did that come from? And that's because you're having a bleed through in which you're experiencing the reality that you were, are in with Tony. So that often will happen, especially as you start to raise your vibration because the concept of linearity the concept of time being linear starts to shift that which brings me to the next topic which is time you had spoken about recording your son and that was days ago and he and and so the concept of time starts to change as you move from third dimension where time is linear into fourth dimension time is circular time becomes circular in the lower planes of fourth dimension as you move higher to the middle and upper planes time becomes spherical and then when you move into your um your ascended the fifth dimensional which is as we transcend this experiment time collapses altogether and there is no time there it's or you could say it's all simultaneous so i just wanted to kind of touch on those things because mm -hmm. as we are starting to experience this it's important to understand the construct and what i call the consciousness mechanics behind all of how this stuff works because that's how we learn to consciously create this reality it's not just to experience this stuff but to understand and what it is we're experiencing so that we can then create it ourselves so when we take apart a, a of radio for example we understand all the parts and then we can put it back together again and make a better radio and that's kind of what this is all about so there you go <laughs>
Thank you so much. And I'm so glad you touched upon time because I thought the same, I was thinking the same thing when Sherry talked about time. It is that truly there is only the now. And in spirit, they know that. Because in my reading with Suzanne, um, Kyle was bringing up a lot of things that were going to happen to me that day. That had not happened. So I was like, when I was in the reading, I'm like, hum. But, you know, they all happened <laughs> within a few days. Everything he talked about made sense. I'm like, he knew. He knew what was going to happen in my day. And he talked about it with the reading. You know, I had the reading at 11 a.m. And he talked about stuff that was happening at 6 p.m. That shows you. And there, there is no time where our children are. They, and they see what's happening now in the past and in the future all at once yes <laughs> it's beautiful yes okay i just just want to add one thing to that and that is that's why when we go to psychics okay psychics cannot always tell what's going to happen because because anything can change at a moment depending on our thoughts emotions and beliefs what a psychic can tell you is according oh, okay. to yes according mm -hmm. to what your time according to where you are right now if you continue in this trajectory this is the likely outcome this right. is the probability probable yeah. reality it sounds a lot like seth <laughs> Did you read yeah. Seth and Jane Roberts? Well, funny, funny that, funny you mentioned that. Thank you. It's amazing how we're really, really sinking and gelling in. And we're yeah. really, we are really showing the one mind oh. here. But when I was 13, somehow, I do not know how, I ended up with this book, The Seth Material. It changed my life. I bought, I got the book. And when I started to read the book, it was like, oh my, I knew all of this stuff, but I never talked about it. And it gave me permission. It was like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. So but the funny thing was, I tried to read it with my mind. Couldn't read it. I couldn't. So I read the first page. Couldn't get it. So I read the first page again. Couldn't get it. So I read the first page. I just went back and back. And I never actually read the book. I got frustrated, put the book on a shelf. Then I woke up. Done. It's read. I read it through osmosis. And so I'm very, very connected to Seth. And a lot of what we talk a lot about, you create your own reality and what that looks like from an applicational perspective and an implemental perspective so yeah Seth is is oh one of the well, I used to go to the ESP classes and Did actually you? met my husband in Elmira in Jane's home wow. and, and um, yeah there's a lot about it in my first book healing from the inside out and wow. the outside in but um, Seth always said that time was simultaneous that yes. was his comment you know and it, it is really hard to experience that because we are going to experience time as a series of moments. But I do know just from the experiences I have with someone I converse with who's in spirit, yes. that there's truth to it. I, I played it back. I made one yesterday morning in the afternoon. My sister came by to visit me. I played it back last night and he said, I see Aunt Sandra came to visit. But I made the recording hours before <laughs> Aunt Sandra came to visit. So. I know it's true, but it still is impossible to experience because yes. as long as we're plugged into this framework, it's going to feel like a linear series of moments. And so it's pretty interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it has to. It has to because like Einstein said, time is what allows us to, to so that is what it stops everything from happening all at once. We can't conceive of it if everything happens all at once. I can't once. imagine how we'd know <laughs> what to do because... Exactly. If we could see all those levels, what which one would be real? Which reality would be mine? Right? I mean, what would I focus on? You know. So. Well, and that's that's the point. We want to be able to focus on one thing at one time, so we can offer the experience, the emotional experience of that focus up to source. So you know, we're born yeah. into this planet alone, and we die alone. Even if you die in a plane crash of seven hundred right. people, you're still dying alone. Yeah. It's you. And, and what I call higher self, you and, and spirit or source, and as I refer to as higher self, trust for me is to rely upon self, capital S, self, totally. But I love that. So thank you so much, Dove. Oh. That was uh, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm going to be taking that to my classes. I hope you're okay with that because that's a beautiful comment. Uh, I'm going to be taking a live to my classes. Okay, see? Great. Yes, oh, Nick, Nikki, I see your hand. Nikki, I just, please. I just, oh my God, this is so beautiful because I just wanted to add, I get a call probably every day uh, from friends. How are you doing? How are you doing? They're expecting me to crash. I think they believe I'm in denial. And what you guys have just triggered in me is the knowing that I believe in instantaneous change. I believe in an instant shift. You know, even... 
I feel even my father here with us right now because when he died, he said to me, you'll be able to take care of everything. And I thought he meant his estate, which he left in a big mess. But I feel he's with me now in regard to the deprogramming I'm doing of what he lived by, which he, funny, because I feel Suzanne is still with us because my father was a member of what was called the Devil's Brigade in the Second World War, which you can imagine what that means. So he was a legal killer coming back into a society where he was told to be kind and gentle. That's the environment I grew up in. But knowing somewhere that got activated, and I think it took the death of my child to really wake me up to the true love that is available to us and to have that ability to wake up to it very, very quickly. I don't believe that it takes a lot of time to heal. We can have, because of what you guys have been talking about, the the um, simultaneous time, everything happening at once, that um, it can be very fast. So I just wanted to add that because uh, it, it, it makes a big, big difference. Uh, I, I want to add that, you know, in my work with bereaved parents, when I see someone finally really get that their child has not been erased from the whole goddamn universe, it is absolutely phenomenal i mean you it's tangible the relief and and, and probably because it is so erroneous because on some level we absolutely know it's not true that they weren't destroyed they didn't disappear but we're not taught this in our society and so people it's so hard to live with that and it's not true but people don't know better and so in part it's our job to bring this knowledge out because they you're right they they don't have to suffer to the depth that they do if they only understood that not only have they not been erased from the whole universe, but you can still have a relationship, a different type, but hey, it's pretty damn good. <laughs> so true. Yes, yes, Dove, please, Chair. Thank you, Sherry. Yes, uh, Dove. Thank you, yeah, thank you, Sherry, and, and thank you, Sandra, for, for pointing out uh, that you're going to use TRUSC, and I said, well, I'm going to use a live uh, alive is really about looking at equality, that we are all equal and the same. One of the most incredible paragraphs in the Course of Miracles is in Lesson 187, which is, I bless the world because I bless myself. Now, for, for the most part, you you don't think you can bless the world until you finally arrived at this high place where you finally have learned everything. And actually that's not true because everything is happening in the now. So uh, as it says, uh, time is the vast illusion. And if you think that there's something that you're going to get that's more than you already have, then you're not valuing what you are right now. So there's one of the great lines in the course is that your worth is established by God. Your worth is established by source. Your worth is established by your spirit, spirit being one with all. So it says, I bless the world because I bless myself. And I always like to say that in paragraph five, he says, give gladly. You can only gain thereby. So in this world, we don't give gladly because we think that we're going to lose something. If I, if I give all, you know, you know, What's left for me? And that's the belief that there is more and less, more and less. And the idea of more is actually the belief that we are not all equal and the same. There's a, some are more and some are less. And of course, you listen to the politicians, there's the haves and the have nots. And, you know, and the world is unfair. Well, of course, we made the world unfair. Now, here in paragraph six, what, is what I call one of the most horrific paragraphs in the course, the word is horrific paragraphs in the course and he starts with laughter and he ends in laughter and he tells you what all pain and suffering is for it's really for nothing but let's let's read it i'm reading it only because i don't want to misquote anything because if you get the gist of what he's saying you're going to love it he says never forget you give but to yourself so when he says give gladly, you know, who, who do you think you're giving to? You think you're giving to somebody out there, really? No, there's only one. There's only one. You're always giving to the, to the law of God, which is the law of one, is what I give. I give to myself. So 
what am I going to give? Okay, now, here we, here we get into why there was pain and suffering. It says, never forget, you give but to yourself who understands what giving means, must laugh, must laugh at the idea of sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is the belief in specialness, that some people are more special and some people are less special. Some people I value more, some people I value less. That's what sacrifice is, is seeing differences when, as a matter of fact, there are no differences. Differences in the illusion, in reality, no, we are one. So it says, nor can this person fail to recognize the many forms which sacrifice may take. Now, here's the horrific part of it. He laughs as well at pain and loss, at sickness and at grief, at poverty, starvation, and at death. He recognizes that sacrifice remains the one idea that stands behind them all. Sacrifice is the one idea behind all of the pain and suffering and lack and scarcity, poverty, starvation, and even death. And in his gentle laughter, they are healed. In his gentle laughter. So how is that possible? The, the, the average person, well, how could you laugh at what's going on in the world? I mean, where is your compassion? Where is, you know, where's your empathy for what's going on? And yet the word says, and in his gentle laughter are they healed. How is it possible that you can heal anything that looks so horrific? Well, where is it taking place? Is it taking place out in the world? The world is an outside picture, an outside mirror of an inward condition. I am not valuing the truth of what I am. I am not seeing myself as worthy. I am not seeing myself as one that can bless the world. One day I might be able to bless the world if I learned everything that there is to learn. No, <laughs> there is no time. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. There's a line in the course that says, there is nothing outside of you. This is what you must ultimately learn. And I remember reading that 25, 30 years ago. I said, well, one day I'm going to ultimately learn that there's nothing outside of me. A few years ago, I realized, what do you mean by ultimately? <laughs> it's not in the future. <laughs> it's right now. There's nothing outside of you. You're always speaking about yourself. You're always giving to yourself. What is it that you would give? You bless yourself. You extend and give the blessings to all. You are the cause. I love that word, that the idea, I think it was Sherry who talked about causation. Yes, I am cause. I'm the dreamer of the dream. Yes. And, and you're, when you're saying, Sandra, you know, does certainly remind me of Star Trek. You know, we, <laughs> you, 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 uh, you, you go on the holodeck Yes. And you, can play, and you can play any program you want. You can go back to the 1890s in Chicago and, and guns and, and gangs and, and mobs yes. or the 1920s, I should say. Yes. But, you know, it's a program. You, yes. you can play any program you want. And so when you realize that you're the dreamer of the dream, you can finally say, it's time to wake up. I really have no need to learn anymore. I really have no need to learn anymore. Right. I choose peace instead yeah. and peace is equality i choose to see myself as equal not more not less thank right. you i just thank wanted to share that thank you Doug. i have thank a great you. analogy um check this out i love this i heard this in a i think it was a buddhist textbook i read once and they said well you know Look at it. Look at it this way. What What's the difference between your fingers? I mean, you know, one's shorter, one's taller. You know, one's got a callus over here. One's one sports a ring, but basically they're all exactly the same. They're all connected at the base. They yes. all grow out of the same source, and that's kind of how I look at the individuality of people. You know, we're we're as different and as similar as our fingers in one hand. We have individual differences, but we're all the same. We all have the same energy running through us. We're all connected to the same source. And I just think that's a good one, because you can look at things. 
That's a beautiful. That's a beautiful. I just want to I just wanna add this. one thing to that, Sherry. Sure. When you raise your hand and you were showing, okay, here's Kate. So, so I can see all your fingers connected to your hand, but get a little bit, bring it a little bit down in the screen, and then now I only see your fingers. Now, if you go a little further down, I can't see the connection. Everything it appears separate to me. Very good. Very good. So, Very good. depending on your angle, right? right if you get a, a greater um, and more expanded view, now you can see how it's connected. It's the same thing with all of us. I guess. Exactly. So, so, so true. So, so true. And I love it. I love that it all comes back to the oneness. I love that. And the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes from the Bible. When I, before I understood the truth of oneness, I did not understand how can people have peace uh, and like like Doug was saying, look out and all the craziness that is going on. But when you un uh, when you understand the truth of oneness, the truth of who you really are, you do have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And you you have bring a gentle. There's compassion, but the compassion is that you know who they are, whether they know it or not. You know their divine light. You know there is no true harm. They're not truly in harm's way. You know that. And all you can do is send them love and light till they know that. So I, I, I love that. So I, I, I know we, I don't, not even, I'm not even watching a clock, but to, to bring the shows to a close, I like, for me, I always keep things simple. For me, it's all about love. Love is the key. Love is the answer. And love yourself because that is truly, there is nothing out there. That's an illusion that we're creating. But the love starts from within. So bringing love from your inside out, bringing that love inside and sharing it with the world. So I just like everybody to go, to go around the panel and just give your thoughts about love because to me, love is all there is. Okay, we'll start with Anne. No, oh, you've said it. Love is all there is. And I, I think we have to look at that and recognize that from the scriptures and everything, it's all about love. God has loved us with an everlasting love. He tells us the things he did, we could do and greater things than these. So there are a tremendous amount of promises having to do with love and loving your neighbor. You know, the, the great commandment, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Well, I think people can love God, love their neighbor. And the hardest part is to love yourself. And so that's the part when you're doing the great commandment that people really don't think about. Love yourself. Your neighbor is yourself. So true. That is so true. The golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said that because he knew. Jesus knew your neighbor was yourself. So Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And that golden rule is do unto others is at the core of all major religions. So people, when they think of look at religions, they look at the differences, but at the core is love. And they all the, the same love is at the core of all major religions. And we're told in the scriptures that uh, we are God's children of the most high. And that's the one of the most offensive things for people in a lot of religions that you were gods. Well, of course, God beings have unlimited power to do anything. And the truth is, we're all exactly like that. We have the power to create and to do anything we set ourselves to. And so there are some wonderful things that people throw out the Bible, especially New Age people. They go, oh, you know, the Bible. But there are some gems in the Bible, some golden ore that you can find in the Bible. So don't throw it all out because some of it is, you know, controversial. Um, don't yes. don't don't throw it out at all. By the way, <laughs> yes. Now it's so true with that. There's yeah. pearls of wisdom in the Bible. Yes, there is. Okay, go ahead, Sherry. I was going to say, and, and one of the things that Seth had said too was that you know God speaks through Sherry as a Sherry and through Anne as an Anne, and so in a sense, God speaks through each one of us by being ourselves, the unique individual that you are. If you put any part of yourself out of your heart, then in a sense, you're putting God out of your heart. And I think that's why Dove is saying, you know, to give to others, you have to give to yourself. It's because you'll stop that flow. 
by when you put some, when you put yourself out of your heart, then you're not loving the God as it speaks through you. And therefore, how can you let your, how can your love flow to anyone else? You've blocked up God, you know, you've judged God as it comes through you. So I think that that's majorly important. The other thing I've learned is that that love is so much stronger than death. Um, I mean, it just, it just, just finds a way like that little flower or plant that shoots through the pavement in the city and comes up towards the sun. It's the same thing with our loved ones. Um, they may be in another, we, we may be in two different vibrational worlds, but we're still one family with the people we love. And, you know, uh, let me just say this about Sherry Pearl. Uh, she has the prayer registry, which oh. is absolutely wonderful. Hundreds of people who have lost children and loved ones, and they are recognized each day on the death of their, uh, on their anniversary yeah, of their passing. And it's a wonderful service of comfort for parents. And log on to that and get on that because it's really wonderful when you do thank it. you your child is prayed for and you pray for other children sorry and it's free <laughs> so just you, you can just google me you'll find the prayer registry right wow yeah we need your son <laughs> well yeah, and thank you uh, uh i'm definitely going to tell people about uh, your side sherry uh, and when you said don't uh, you know the new age people throw the bible out actually um th there is a book called the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the New Testament. It was channeled by a woman, Regina Dawn Akers, who is the head of the church called Awakening Together, which Caroline and I used to teach at. I'm an ordained minister of Awakening Together. So there is a book, and I, I tell you, if anyone really wants to get a new way of seeing the, the, the New Testament, uh, all the books of the New Testament are seen through the eyes, the spiritual eye, of the Holy Spirit, rather than as the ego interprets, well, God did this and God did that. No, no, God, God didn't really do anything. We're doing it all, literally. So it really is about interpretation. Who is going to be your interpreter? If you if you're using the voice in your in your head as your interpreter, you say, well, I'm throwing the Bible out. It's no good. Uh, there was a chapter in the Course of Miracles, chapter six, called the Message of the Crucifixion. Now, most people say, well, you know, God was so loving. Why did he have his son crucified? Well, what kind of thing is that? So the Course of Miracles, which is written as uh, not from anybody in body form, but it came, it was channeled through a woman named Helen Shepman. It came from outside of this world, fifth dimension, 12th dimension, I don't care. But it wasn't written in third or fourth dimension at all. So in the message of the crucifixion, which is chapter six, he says, you know, everyone's going to be crucified every single day. And we all go through what we, he calls mini crucifixions. And of course, I spell crucifixion, F-I-C-T-I-O-N. It's, you know, <laughs> you're, you're making it up. You're making it up as, as you go. And say, well, isn't that terrible what somebody said to me, what, what they did to me, they hung up on me, they betrayed me. He said, no. He said, the message of the crucifixion is not the crucifixion. It's the resurrection. It's the right. resurrection. I didn't come here to show that I could be nailed to a cross. No, I came to show that okay. I can rise above the world. I can rise above death. That death itself is not real. That's the message of the I crucifixion agree. is the resurrection. So the message of chapter six is teach only love for that is what you are. Love, love is the function of oneness. And if I was going to give a, a quote, a, a way to define it, you can't define love, of course, because who is there to define love when it's really our oneness? There's nothing, there's no, no one can define oneness. But it's actually the glue. It's the glue that actually is the oneness. You know, the, as you talk about going quantum, the, the, the course doesn't use the word quantum, but it uses the word magnitude. So we're either into our littleness or into our magnitude. The magnitude is our oneness. It's the one mind, which, which is not the mind that I created. I, I was created, as God said, you are beloved of me always, and I am beloved of you. And this is what is, is forever true. And when we answered, I will, that was our creation. So I didn't create myself. I am created by the love of God. So my willingness to remember is in every encounter, exactly as you say, you, you see your neighbor as yourself. You know, actually, 
a lot of people think it comes from the New Testament, but Jesus was Jewish, and he, read the, and, and, and he read the Torah very well. Yeah. And on the middle, Sherry, you, you may not know this, but on the middle day of the Torah, the reading is the golden rule, do unto others, or, give, or, or, or you would not do to your neighbor what you would not have your neighbor do to you. That was read on the middle day of the Torah. And Jesus knew the Torah really, really well. But but he was in a scene. He was a mystical Jew. He didn't he didn't go according to the traditions and the rules and the regulations. He said, No, no, no. I and the Father are one. Yes. That oneness is the love yes. of, of God. I and the Father. We're all yes. one with Father. You know, yes. Father and Son is one. It's not it's not one Son of God, as it says in three nineteen, by the way, or, or, okay. or John three sixteen. So it's true. A, you know, he's so he's so loved. Right, he gave the world right. to his sonship, to the sonship, and right. they will either see it for what it is and say, wow, thank you so yeah. much. I love the experience, and it is an experiment, just like going yeah. on a holiday. It's right. an experiment. And when, yeah. you, when you're finally tired of the experiment, you say, <laughs> going home. Right. Yeah, so true, Dev. And, and for me, oneness and love are, are the same. Love, for me, we are the essence of love. Um, science has proven everything is energy. That energy is love. There is nothing but love. There's nothing but energy. That energy has, we can name it love. So the essence of who we are is love. That's who we are. Nikki, can you share a few words before we, 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 we I'm sure this has been so amazing. It really has. But Nikki, why well, you can share yeah, a few no, I'd love to. And, and it's funny because one thing I think to the uh, Bible part is universally people know when you say, what would Jesus do? They know it's what would love do. That is universal. So that will always live on. And also um, that, um, Oh, I had a thought. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, I think, also knew the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. Like, I think he knew all writings of all teachings of pure love. So um, I, yesterday, and I'll just end with this, but yesterday, and I don't know where it came, who to give attribution to, but I heard, I love me so much, so I can love you so much. So you can love you so much, so you can love me. So, <laughs> nice. <laughs> just a full circle that's why we're here. So thank you. I'm just so glad to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I am so thankful. This is the best birthday gift. <laughs> so thankful. So thankful. Uh, it, this is just so amazing. And I, I, I can't wait to publish this. We are pre-recording this on my birthday and it will air tomorrow night, mm. which is um, January what, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Yeah, we have no superstitions here. No fear here. We have no fear. So, yes. What time, what time Carolyn? It will 7 p.m. Eastern. So, so, I know you're in Mountain. 5 o'clock our time. Yes, 5 o'clock, yes. So, this will air, and I'm sure I know, you know, I'm going to just, let's, let's all just spread this recording as far, far and wide so people can hear the, the pearls of truth, you know, the pearls of the true nature of reality. And hopefully this will resonate, especially with those who are grieving, with those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. If they could truly understand that loved one is right there with you, truly understand that loved one is feeling your pain, if you're feeling pain, but that loved one is feeling your joy when you're feeling joy. So when you think of that loved one that's on the other side, think of them with love and joy. And that will really, truly bring, you know, peace into their heart and yours. Yes. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I am so, so happy. I am so, so thankful. And <laughs> we are definitely going to keep in touch. All of you now are family. So <laughs> we are just saying, and, and Dove and Sherry and I, we're close enough to actually get together and party. Absolutely. Yeah. In New York City. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So thank you. I am so thankful and so grateful for everyone. And Suzanne, who had to leave a little early. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, words, I, honestly, I can never find the words to uh, express my gratitude when I feel so full because words don't, don't do it justice. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have one last thing to add. Sure. From a question of miracles. And, and this is about, I just realized as you were speaking, it's not only for people that are living in your in your people's dream, it's also for people that weren't living in your people's dream that every encounter is a holy encounter every encounter as you see them you're going to see yourself as you treat them you're going to treat yourself as you think of them you're going to think of yourself leave no one without giving them salvation for you either going to find yourself or lose yourself in the next encounter so whoever that encounter is with whether it's somebody in body form or not in body form as you see them you're gonna. It's it's never a poor me. It's always, thank you so much for being in my life. Thank you so much for being in my. Life. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, Anne, Anne. You had a few words. Anne. Um, I'm not sure. I must have forgotten while I was writing. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you all had some wonderful. I'm a I'm a collector of quotes, and so oh. as you in each of you, I wrote down little special quotes. <laughs> Yeah, I have yeah. my code collection that's making my computer run out of space. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and I just wanted to add um, to what uh, Deb was saying, you know, er every experience is a holy experience. We might look at a whole, holy as being W-H-O-L. E because mm -hmm. that really is the truth it's because it, it's part of you we are whole as we are so holy really is um, every experience is a whole part of you but it's a whole it's part of the greater whole that is you that's true so true so, so true so true but thank you thank you all so much I love you I have nothing but love and uh, appreciation and gratitude all right all right bye bye <laughs> Hi, okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.